the program tonight starts with uh, me after giving the announcement, uh, continue my conversation uh, about my understanding of the uprise of Imam Hussein. And I covered the historical aspect of it last night. Uh, how, where did the Muslim community go wrong that 50 years after death of a beloved prophet, his grand uh, children were um, massacred uh, in a manner that when we speak about it today, it, it, it brings tears to our, our eyes. And, and so I covered that and, and the deviation started even during the uh, time of prophet in Ghazvat al-Uhud, uh, how uh, people just didn't listen to private, uh, the prophet's advice. They left their post from the mountain, led to death of uh, our um, uh, uh, uncle of our prophet and, and so forth. And then uh, after uh, our prophet's death, they didn't listen to uh, prophet's advice regarding the next leader and uh, how and that led to um, then uh, more deviation and then uh, appointing Abu Sufyan, the, you know, the sworn enemy of the prophet uh, as a uh, uh, as a head of a, um, a group of army to invade uh, Syria and take over and they become governor. And then after that, uh, the, another son of Abu Sufyan became the governor, Mu'awiyah. And, and I told you how he invaded other um, nations around. And the, the, the purpose was not to spread Islam, but rather than uh, govern and collect taxation. So a lot of people were um, uh, getting used to uh, a lot of free money. And so then you could see uh, when, when you go that far, um, you deviate from uh, the straight path, Sirat you know, al-Mustaqim, then you end up uh, massacring the uh, grandson of the Prophet in such a manner. And we, I talked about what Imam Hussein stood for and the values that he, he taught us. So I continue on. If you remember, Imam was in on a on a way uh, from Mecca because they somebody brought the mess, uh, message to him that uh, Yazid's uh, uh, agents are on the way to kill you uh, in in Mecca or get your oath. And um, so Imam didn't want any bloodshed, so he left uh, on a path to Kufa because he had Kuf, uh, people from Kufa uh, invited him to come there so he could lead. And then uh, the story uh, how Yazid got hold of that story and assigned a new governor, uh, Ubaidullah, and how Ubaidullah, in my opinion, like a CIA, head of CIA today, becoming a governor, was using trick and force and how he got to the city. And, and um, uh, people of Kufa uh, were sort of wishy-washy and they took their oath back because they were scared of life and some of them were bought and, and so forth. And so... You could see how this thing is leading and while Imam Hussein is coming from Mecca toward Kufa, uh, on his way there, his uh, uh, cousin who went to Kufa to figure out if the oath, you know, the oath is real from people of Kufa and was uh, murdered by Obidillah. And he had an opportunity to assassinate Obidillah. And I emphasized that Ubaidillah didn't use that opportunity and said, our prophet said, uh, Muslims will never assassinate anyone. So another um, counter message to people that call Muslims assassin, you know, people who do assassination. So then, uh, so that's the first, uh, you know, the thing that I emphasize, these ethical values uh, that Imam Hussein and his followers at that time followed. And then Imam on the way uh, got a message that the people of Kufa, uh, are not going to support you, Ubaidullah is there, and, and so forth. And Hor was sent to escort Imam so he will not enter Kufa. Because even though um, Ubaidullah was using force in Kufa, still they didn't want Imam there because they thought people may go back and, and so forth. So Imam is being escorted in the desert uh, from uh, Mecca to Kufa. People who are from that region know that area is very hot. And this is happening in October right? September, October, because October 10th is the 10th day of Muharram in year 680, where the day of Ashura that happened was that day. So in heat of the desert, they get to a, 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 a place that they're resting, 
And uh, Imam in his camp and there uh, having water for horses and for people to drink, um, Hor's army gets there and Imam asks his uh, people to share water with the enemy. And then after that, uh, when Imam wanted to pray, uh, Hor and his army joined the Imam for the prayer. It's a very strong message there because at that time when Hor's army got there, they were extremely tired. When they got to this water hole, extremely tired, an opportunity for Imam and his followers to get, you know, massacre Hor and his soldiers because they were extremely tired and thirsty. And Imam said, we will never start a, a war. We are, we are not, we're not here to start a war. And so and there's a strong message in that, that Imam taught us that peace could be achieved by kindness. Killing will never lead to peace. And we will see the impact of this act later in my talk. And then, uh, of course, um, at, at that point, um, Imam Hussein told Hor, um, just give us a passage. Let us just move out of Iraq and um, I'll go to Iran. I want to go somewhere that I could spread, um, revive the religion of Islam for the nation of Islam. And I'm here to do Amr bin Aruf and Nahyaz Munkar uh, to spread good deeds and uh, prevent people from evil deeds. And uh, so... But Hor said, you know, I have, you know, I'm here to uh, not allow you to go to Kufa and just brought him on to uh, where we call Karbala. People from Iraq know the where Karbala is situated and how hot it gets in that time of the year. So the second day of Muharram, Imam gets there. I'm reviewing the history for some of the younger people because they don't know the story of the, for, uh, for those of us who heard the story many times in my life, I apologize. But it's important to talk about this history because when I was a little kid, I thought the war or the battle started from the first day of Muharram until the last day of Muharram. There was no killing, no fighting until really the last day, which we, it's today. And on the noon of Ashura, probably more than, it didn't last more than 20 minutes. And some people say two hours. So um, this, is, this is the first lesson we learned from Imam Hussein that um, you don't, uh, you're kind with your enemy because that could have um, everlasting effect. Investing in something that the payoff is a lot bigger. When you give your kindness, instead of uh, your hate uh, for your enemy. And by the third day, Ubedillah Ziyad assigns Amr Saad, Umar ibn Saad, as the head of the field, you know, the general for the field of Karbala. He comes, there are story that he brought 4,000 troops, then 1,000 of Hor's army was there already. And then some people say there were 20 or 30,000. It doesn't matter. 5,000 to what we know, 72 men were killed, including infant, the six-month baby of Imam Hussein. And Imam Zainal Abedin was the only male who survived. So 73 men, 2,000, whatever it is, it's not a fair... But they had assignment to get oath from Imam Hussein, get his vote of confidence or kill him in the field. And by the seventh day of Muharram, um, uh, uh, Umar, Umar ibn Sa'd um, said, no more access to water. So from the seventh day until the 10th day, there was no water coming to camp of Imam Hussein. And if you if you are in a place that temperature gets between 47 to 50 in the shade, and they're in the desert sun, you know it's getting hot. Everybody's getting thirsty. Kids are crying. And on the tenth day, uh, this is when you know the peak of uh, harshness comes. 
But amazing thing, that's one last night I talked about uh, Imam Hussein being brave. And every one of us have an image of Imam Hussein in our head. The image of Imam Hussein that I have in my head is a brave individual. So I never pity Imam Hussein for what he went through. I envied his braveness, right? The, the horrible act of Yazid's army doing to Imam Hussein, what did, of course, it makes you, you know, emotional, but the more, I get more emotional when I think of the beauty of the pure faith and beauty of a man who is so uh, brave. On the ninth, uh, you know, like last night, Imam Hussein turned off the light and asked his followers, he said, they are here to get me. I take my oath away from you so you are free. Use the darkness of the night and get out. There is no oath. You don't owe me nothing. Take this opportunity to go. How many of us are in a battle? How many of us? Put yourself in that position. How many of us are in a battle? We have 70 people around us and we tell them, go. I'm going to take this by myself. 5,000, 30,000, they're here to kill me. Go, use the darkness so I can identify who's leading. Not a single individual left. That tells you they had faith in Imam Hussein's faith to Allah, they, through Imam Hussein's, they faith to Allah was as strong, and they remain. That's the picture that I have in mind of Imam Hussein. Not somebody who's super strong, like he's not a superhero, but his values give him such strength and power that that sticks to my head, a huge uh, strength in terms of being brave to face uh, the ultimate death because he knew that death is a bridge to embrace Allah. So, and I was thinking of that myself. If I go to sleep tonight and know tomorrow morning I'm going to face army of thousands and I'm going to be killed because they told me last night either handshake or death. And what would I do? Would I get out of bed? Most of us would not get out of bed. Maybe something will fly over. You know, maybe this will pass us. Let me not get out of my tent. There is a lesson from Imam Hussein to all of us from this. When we face hardship in our life, what do we do? As a father, when I'm in a, hard, a harsh situation financially, do I lose my faith and sort of cry in front of my kids and say, about Bakhshadeen? Or I show leadership and say, you know, I'm going to do something else. This is what Imam Hussein shows us. When you are faced with calamity, when with death, you stay strong. Because Imam Hussein, not only he got up, some of you got to listen to some of the speeches he gave on the morning of Ashura. This is you can't imagine a man being surrounded, people surrounding his family, his little kids. He is so strong and he delivers his last sermon to these people. That's that's what we need to remember. That that's leadership, a, a, a leadership of a faith, a leadership of a community a leadership of a family, a leadership at a company, a leadership at a university. That's what we need to learn from Imam Hussein and display it in our life. When we, you know, some of us, uh, our fiance breaks up with us, we want to commit suicide, right? Uh, some of us here, you know, we had our fiance breaking up and we thought that's the end of the world. I'm going to throw myself off the building. And here you have an imam that we inherited these values, but we don't pay attention. Instead, we focus on the emotional aspect and we want to cry and get it over with. We don't, we don't want to think about uh, how to face hardship. We have role model, how he faced the hardship. And some of these amazing 
speeches on this day is amazing. And also his brother Abbas could not see the kids crying, right? He gets on his horse and says, you know, 30,000 army, I'm going to go get water. And there are different uh, version of the story that he took 30 men with himself and eventually he got water and brought it to tent. But some people believe that on the way back, they cut off his arm and the, the bag of water uh, fell and kids never got water. But whatever it is, when he got to the river, the story has he didn't drink from that water. He didn't want, he didn't want to be the first one to uh, quench his thirst. And that shows another uh, brave individual in this uh, thinking of others. And so that's, that's something for us to remember. Uh, thinking of others is very important. And these are the lessons we learn. By God, I will never surrender to my enemies like a humiliated person and never pledge alliance to them like slaves. This is Imam Hussein, morning of Ashura. Does this sound like a man who's scared of death? An army of 30,000? He says, by God, by God, I will not do this. And then he shouts, martyrdom for what is right is nothing but happiness. And living under tyrant is nothing but living in a hell. How many of us in face of death, could stand up and say, I won't give in to tyrants. Think of today in political system in the country, when we, and I'm, I'm not going to name names. Someone was a president of this country. He came up with a word for lies, alternative truth, right? Alternative to truth, a lie. But his fellow party men would not object to it because they would lose votes from uh, this president's supporters, right? But what is, what is our spiritual leader, what, what is our imam is telling us? I'll give my life. I'll never give in to a tyrant. That should be a lesson to us that should never give up to tyrants, to bullies, at schoolyard, in our household. If we see our dad bullying our mom, we should stand up, speak up, seek help. Death with digni dignity is better than life of humiliation. To me, and then at some point, he tells the army, don't, don't start the war. Don't, don't, you know, speed up this process. Give me an opportunity so I could tell you what I stood for. Why am I opposing this? By the way, People who killed Imam Hussein were not, <clears throat> were not from another religion. These are Muslims. You know Shem, who we, we know the person who killed Imam Hussein. He walked to Hajj 16 times. The ritual of Hajj, you know, some people think it's more savab if you walk instead of getting on a horse or camel, right? And he was in the army of uh, Imam Ali to fight Muawiyah in the first civil war. Right, he, and and they say you know his his praying was you know it's like amazing. That, that's that's the person on that side. That's another lesson that us should never we should never follow a leader with our eyes closed, right? Just because. Somebody is an imam at a masjid or somebody is a, you know, a religious man leading something uh, just with the title. But we know their action is against Quran, against the teaching of Prophet, peace be upon him, 
against the teaching of Islam, against ethics, against the norm of the religion, uh, we, should, we should speak up. And Shem thought that Yazid is Khalifat al-Allah, right? He is the, the governor assigned by Allah. And Imam Hussein rose against the Khalif. So to him, it doesn't matter who the Khalif is, Ali or Yazid. So when Ali was the Khalif, he, he was in the army of Ali against Muawiyah. Today, Yazid is Khalif. He's in the army against Hussein, who are, who's opposing. So not knowing the, the you know, what's the, who, who's on the right side of an argument is, could lead us to trouble. And finally, he tells his family, be patient, you noble ones. Death is only a bridge that takes you from misery and, and loss to vast paradise and eternal graces. And of course, we know what happened. One by one, all the men of Imam Hussein uh, support group were killed. And they just didn't end there. They ran their horses over the bodies. They didn't give them proper burial. They ran their horses back and forth, back and forth to pulverize the bodies to the ground. And as a prize, they cut off the head of Imam Hussein to take it to Yazid to get, to, uh, to get their price. You know, the trophy. Grandson of the Prophet. And of course, on this eve, they set fire on the camp. Women and children running out of the tents, fire blazed. Bibi Zainab lost his children, love of his life, his brother. Now needs to go around the bushes and find the little girls. And by God, if Imam Hussein was brave, I don't know what Zainab, what could you say about Zainab, the sister of Imam Hussein? We all know the story when they took the family of Imam Hussein to Damascus, Syria, at the palace of Yazid. Imam Hussein's head was in a, a golden tray. And Yazid was using his bamboo stick, hitting the lips of Imam Hussein, and told Bibi Zainab, did you see how we humiliated you thing? Did you see how we destroyed you? And Zainab stands up there and said, by grace of Allah, I don't see nothing but beauty in this. So our hearts shakes because of strength of these people. They never give in to the enemy and say, by God's grace, I don't see nothing but beauty. And I've Spoken my allowed time, but the purpose of my speech was at the end. What is our role? 21st century, as people who inherited this beautiful story, 
we have a we have multiple characters as role models. What is our responsibility? First of all, Imam Hussein doesn't belong to us Shiites. It doesn't belong to just Muslims. Imam Hussein belongs to all humanity. My suggestion is every one of us is responsible to learn the message of Imam Hussein and share it with all our friends, regardless of their faith. Draw the parallel history of Jesus, Prophet Jesus, and story of Imam Hussein. Prophet Jesus stood to the religious scholars of his time who were embezzling money, who were doing wrong things, and he gave his life. And we have a role model, Imam Hussein. The whole country in Western society during Christmas time, have you seen how much giving happening? Of course, corporate America uses the story of Jesus Christ to sell their garbage. And every one of us buy their garbage and give us gifts. They stole that message of Jesus Christ giving his life. And some of us have also uh, stolen the story of Imam Hussein. We use it to our benefit for whatever political reason or for whatever gain there is. Get a fame in our neighborhood. We fed everyone here tonight. <laughs> So in my opinion, we, are, we need to tell the story to others. This is city of Oakland. When you don't have hope, when you don't have direction, when you don't have guidance, you use a lot of your energies on these four wheelers and they... There are, seriously, hundreds of youth get on these four-wheelers, and they take over the city. What we need to tell, put him in a situation of Imam Hussein, ask him, what would you do if you were the leader of your community? What decision would you make? Put people in position of Imam Hussein, and then they feel the empathy. And then we'll understand the story. What would you do if your leader was standing against tyrant, against uh, injustice, was asking for the right of needy and poor people? And then they, they would understand this. And of course, the message is for us. What would... What, we, what did we learn from Imam Hussein in terms of leadership in our family as a father or mother? How do we lead? How, how do we lead by example? Most of us here are supervisors at work. When we have an employee who's super smart, but really uh, social skill of zero, goes left and right, insult men and women, colleagues, but they're good workers. What do we do? Do we take a stand against that? Or we say, you know, he's a good worker. So what? When we are faced with these challenges, this is what we learn from Imam Hussein. You take the stand against certain values. Do you think if Imam Hussein was here, he would shop from Amazon? No, seriously. In 21st century, where the CEO has so much money that all of these benefits come, came from where? All those little stores that would provide jobs for families, those are taken away, right? Would Imam Hussein does everything for convenience through Amazon, you think? Just put yourself, ask these kind of questions. If you have an opportunity to buy your coffee from Starbucks or from mom and pop coffee shop, which one, which one would you do? 
Ask yourself, what would Imam Hussein do if he was living in our time? Would he take a stand when they were killing George Floyd in Minnesota for a $20 counterfeit in such a manner? Would Imam Hussein just sit quietly and say, well, these are black people. It's not, I'm not black. Why should I be out there? Hmm? Is this the stand would Imam Hussein take? These are the questions we should ask ourselves. And these are lessons from our Imam that we could apply to our life in 21st century in our family setting, at work, in a society. Would Imam Hussein, if he had his children at school, would Imam Hussein participated in governorship or part of the parent-teacher association? Would Imam Hussein register in city council? in the city he would live because he could, he could, if they were making wrong decisions, he could speak up and he could set things straight or Imam Hussein would be passive. These are the questions, in my opinion, I ask myself on a daily basis. What would my Imam do in situation like this? And if, when you learn the story of Karbala, teaching of Imam Hussein, decision-making becomes so easy. Imam Hussein is the GPS. And you know what that GPS, the direction we um, typed in? Embrace of Allah, the divine. That's the direction. If you want to use a GPS, to be embraced by God, use Imam Hussein as your GPS. And think of a beautiful thing we inherited. It's called Imam Hussein and his family and his friends, a legacy. Consider yourself, and we should consider ourselves lucky that we have Imam Hussein as our spiritual guide. But Imam Hussein's story needs to be spoken today, and those lessons should be used for us to find our path. A dark path, and you have someone bright light Right? Captain is taking this road to Allah. Just follow that. Yes, emotional outpour is important, but it has to come with this first. We need to do ta'aqbal first. We need to think, learn, and emotionally process that event. And as I said last night, Remembrance of Imam Hussein is reliving the story of Imam Hussein in presence of God today because the story of Imam Hussein in presence of God is timeless. With God, time doesn't have any meaning. Karbala is happening in front of Allah and we are present in that moment observing and learning and applying it to our life. With that, I thank you all for your attention and I apologize I've gone over. Uh, hopefully um, my outpour of my emotion, my feeling for Imam Hussein would make you think and uh, would give me your input. So if next time I'm speaking at the center, I'll do a better job in, 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 in helping because the worst thing you could do is waste uh, people's time, especially uh, mu'mineen's time. So I, I never want to do this. Uh, a loud salawat 